Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to BIV 152, Evolution of Infectious Disease. Okay, so like we start all lectures, um, we'll take the temperature on COVID-19. So uh, the question is, is COVID-19 still spreading exponentially in California? And has sheltering in place helped stop that exponential spread? And so this is a figure uh, that was plotted just very quickly um, by Lin Chao, and he's a professor at UCSD. And what we have on the x-axis is log 10 new cases per day. Let's not worry about this axis in the next lecture when I talk about exponential growth and selection, I'll describe what this, what this means. Um, and this is time on the x-axis um, and uh, what we see, sorry, I think I called this the x-axis, y-axis obviously, and this is the x-axis. Um, and so here we see this, this line um, fit, to the, fit to the early data. And this line suggests that uh, during this period when, when the data points fall on the line, that uh, there was exponential expansion of COVID-19. Um, this point in time is marked because this is when we all began to shelter in place. Um, and so now all of the data points uh, are, are given in blue. And what we see is that there, there seems to be a, a, a shift in their trajectory, not, not immediately, but, um, but now we're in this, this period where we're not falling on this line anymore. So we're not increasing exponentially anymore. We're just basically maintaining the same rate of increase per day. Um, so we are, we, we still have tons of new uh, COVID-19 um, uh, patients arising each and every day, um, but that number isn't growing and growing and growing as, as would be in an exponential expansion. And so it does appear, and you can see just by the, 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 the transition in this data to this data, um, that sheltering in place is having an effect in California. So of course, this is with the caveat that this data is good. Um, you know, this is from uh, the site here. Uh, one of the problems though is that, you know, we know that testing for COVID-19 has been pretty poor. And so it might be that uh, it's not really reflecting how many patients there are in the, in the trends and changes in the number of new patients over time. But assuming that the data is good, uh, this is a really good sign. Uh, on last week, I talked about how there was a symposium about COVID-19 at the University of Pens Pennsylvania. And uh, in case you didn't get to, to, to watch it live, they've actually uploaded all of the talks uh, on YouTube. And so that's the link for the, to go to the talks. And I have to say that one of the really hopeful things uh, that came out of that symposium is that one of the lecturers said that there were about 120 clinical trials underway for different therapeutics and vaccines to fight COVID-19. Um, so scientists are in overdrive trying to produce uh, therapeutics against this, this uh, virus. And it's very, um, it's very I'm, I'm very hopeful that some of these will work and that we'll have a whole barrage of ways to treat uh, people that have COVID-19 or even give people immunity if they don't have COVID-19. So, yep, I am uh, I'm pretty hopeful. I'm glad that social distancing is, is working and I see other strategies in the future as the science um, uh, yields hopefully successful therapeutics. Okay, so that was a relatively short um, uh, temperature update and that's partially because uh, I've worked really hard on these two lectures. Uh, I've reformatted them from last year and I think they're much clearer and nicer, um, but it's taken me a long time. And um, I really wanna just power through these two different subjects, uh, recombination and horizontal gene transfer, as well as genetic drift. Okay, so the first subject is recombination or horizontal gene transfer. And what these both are, are mechanisms to generate genetic variation that are not mutation. So last lecture, we talked about how random mutations arise. This changes the DNA sequence. Those DNA, some of those changes 
can alter the phenotype of an organism. And that's sort of the first step of evolution is to just generate genetic variation. Well, another way to generate genetic variation is through recombination and horizontal gene transfer. Uh, and so what these mechanisms are, are where two different genomes combine and recombine in a way to make a new genome, a hybrid genome. Uh, and the difference between horizontal gene transfer and recombination, you can kind of think of them as, uh, as just being on two different ends of the same spectrum. Recombination tends to happen uh, between uh, the same gene, just their variants of that gene, so alleles of that gene, one donated from one genome and one donated from another genome, and they recombine in a way that doesn't change uh, the genetic code too much. It introduces, it can introduce lots of mutations, um, but doesn't really change the architecture of the genome. Uh, whereas horizontal gene transfer is when you get a whole new gene coming into a genome and adding that gene to the genome. And so that's a case where um, you get, uh, you know, radical changes. You can get whole new genes or whole new segments of a genome. Um, and so that's, that's a really, you know, severe change. And so you can think of recombination at one end and horizontal gene transfer at the other end. Um, and certainly there's cases that are kind of in the gray area between them that it's hard to diagnose whether or not it's horizontal gene transfer or recombination. Um, for this course, I don't want you to sort of worry about, you know, diagnosing whether or not something is recombination or horizontal gene transfer. Uh, for this course, I want you to understand that these are mechanisms for swapping genetic material between genomes, and that's a way to generate genetic variation without mutation. Okay, so those are kind of definitions, but let's, let's look at some examples uh, so you really understand what's, what's going on. And so the first example that I want to uh, look at is actually a possible recombination in SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so I say possible, it's not, it's not great evidence, but there is some evidence that suggests that the strain that's spreading in humans right now is actually recombinant between strains that were circulating in bats and strains that were circulating in pangolins. And so this is, um, this is a cartoon of a phylogeny uh, that relates uh, strains that we had sequenced the whole genomes for in bats, strains that we had sequenced the whole genomes for in pangolin, and strains, and now the strain SARS-CoV-2 that is spreading in, in the human population. And so um, what we found is that this strain is very similar to a strain that they found a while ago in bats, um, and it has some similarity with the strain uh, that they found in pangolins as well, but the bat strain overall is much more similar to the human, the one spreading in humans now than the, the pangolin strain. And so this is just the evolutionary relationship. There is sort of ancestral virus at some point that was spreading and it was infecting pangolins and then it was infecting uh, bats and then it jumped into, into humans. We'll go over phylogenies and how to read these later in the, in the course. What's weird though, is that it, this, this is the picture from across the entire genome, whereas this is a picture where you just sort of zoom into a very small region of a gene. This is the S gene, the spike protein. Um, this is the thing that it uses to recognize the, the host cell. Um, and so it's obviously an important gene in, in being able to recognize human cells and infect human cells. And so, um, but if you zoom into a really small region of this gene, you find that that region, that DNA sequence, is actually more similar to the pangolin than it is to the bat. And so you're getting kind of two different signals. Most of the genome is giving you this pattern, but there's a small little section of this that gives you this pattern here. And when you see that kind of um, discordance between the whole genome and a small section of the genome, what we tend to think can cause that, so there's other processes as well, um, but the, the easiest explanation for it um, is that the, the gene or the small region of the gene, so just about 60 bases of RNA in the S, um, gets transferred 
from the strain that's now circulating in pangolins um, to the strain that then led to the, to the, um, uh, to the current uh, epidemic in humans. And so while most of the genome is, is evolving normally, this small section just sort of jumped across the phylogeny and jumped into this new, uh, new uh, genome, creating a hybrid. And so how would that actually happen? I mean, do, do viruses recombine with each other? You know, what, what, what's going on here? Um, and so the first thing is, is that, you know, we, we, we think of um, these coronaviruses as being associated with a very specific host. So either pangolin or bats or humans, um, but actually they, it seems that a lot of them have a little bit more flexibility in the species that they're able to infect. Um, and certainly we have that example of the tiger in the Bronx Zoo that was infected by the strain that's infecting humans right now. And so sometimes these strains have what we call broad host range, can infect lots of species. And um, so it's possible and probably likely that there's lots of strains of coronavirus, COVID, um, that are circulating between pangolins and bats and maybe other animals as well. And, and even if they have a, a preference that they they're tend to circulate in bats or tend to circulate in pangolins, um, there's sometimes an opportunity for them uh, one of these species to get infected by both the bat strain and the pangolin strain. And so if that happens, then the R and so if that happens, if an if a individual animal is infected by two different strains um, and those two different strains end up infecting the same cell at the same time, then you can get um, RNA recombining with each other. And so how does that happen? How does RNA recombine um, when we think about um, the replication of the coronavirus? And so uh, what we have here is a figure that we looked at already um, uh, two lectures ago. And I want to focus in on this region here. So this is, where, um, this is where the RNA genome of the coronavirus is being replicated by polymerase. Uh, and I have shown a picture where it kind of demonstrates how you could get recombination of a pangolin COVI and a bat COVI DNA, or I'm sorry, RNA. Um, and so what we have here is we have the, we have the polymerase and uh, it is making a new copy. So this is the bat, it's, it's running on the bat um, genome right now. Um, and it's making this new copy. Um, but there's all these other RNAs uh, around it and some have a different source, the pangolin source. And so this polymerase can actually sort of accidentally jump to this RNA for a little bit of time and then jump back to the original RNA. And when it does that, then it introduces this um, re recombination into the genome. And so this is how you can get even a really small recombination like we think possibly happened uh, between the cap, uh, pangolin COVID and the bat COVID. So, you know, it's, it, it is really possible that this is a hybrid virus that, that is spreading in humans. Now, since we made this observation, it then makes us wonder, well, you know, is this hybridization? Is this what actually generated the, the, the genotype that has the phenotype that can spread so well in humans? Um, and so that question, we actually don't know the answer to. Uh, we've just observed that this is probably a recombination, uh, and now it would be great for us to be able to go into the lab and actually begin to measure whether or not um, these mutations that are, that are caused by the recombination actually enhance the potential for the, um, the virus to spread. So um, while um, recombinations, like I was just talking about, uh, can happen between closely related strains of viruses. Um, recombination also happens certainly in humans, we know that, and happens in all of the different parts of, of the tree of life, uh, all of the different domains. And uh, so, um, and what we can see actually is that genes can even shuttle around between bacteria to eukaryotes or archaea bacteria to eukaryotes. Um, and so, 
there's a lot of potential uh, for just a lot of massive genetic exchange between different organisms. And so I wanted to go over now how this sort of massive genetic change actually happens. What are some examples of horizontal gene transfer that can happen between you know, very different organisms? This is, this is where they're getting whole new genes added to their genome. Okay, so, and I wanna focus now on bacteria. And the reason why I wanna focus on bacteria is that um, bacteria often exchange genes with one another, and these genes can uh, be used for antibiotic resistance or be used for uh, enhancing their pathogenicity. And so these are things that we don't want them to, to, to exchange. And so we wanna understand how they do exchange them with the hope that eventually we'll be able to stop them from sharing all of this DNA. Uh, we will talk about those kinds of strategies later in the, in the class. Okay, and so the mechanisms are transformation, conjugation, and transduction. These are just three examples. Uh, the mode of each is um, described here in this table. I'm gonna walk through each of the, the mechanisms uh, and how they work, and so we'll just move on rather than reading that table. So transformation is where bacteria, sometimes they die, they explode because they're infected by viruses, bacteriophages, um, or for other reasons, they, they lice. And when they lice, they release their genome into the, the environment, and other bacteria can actually come along and pick up pieces of that, that DNA, and then um, they also have machines in their cell that they can actually incorporate that DNA into their, into their genome. And so transformation happens um, fairly often with, with some species of bacteria, and um, it's where they can really just scavenge the environment for bits of DNA and see if they work in their own genome. Most of the time, these incorporations of, of foreign uh, DNA probably don't work in their genome, but if they do and they confer something like antibiotic resistance, then they can be very beneficial for the bacteria. Okay, so the second mechanism is conjugation. And what you can think of this is, this is uh, bacterial sex. Uh, so it's where one bacteria has a plasmid that uh, creates this pilus, and uh, it can find another bacteria, connect to that bacteria, and then it exchanges that plasmid, the F plasmid. This is a, uh, there's lots of different conjugation plasmids, but this is a, a good example of one. Um, and then that new bacteria can then mate with other bacteria and exchange the, the F plasmid. And so this is a really efficient way for antibiotic resistance genes to pass around populations if they occur on a plasmid that can cause conjugation. And transduction is the last mechanism uh, that we're gonna talk about. And this is an interesting one. Um, so a phage, that's what this drawing is here, a phage with a, its own genome infecting a bacterial cell. Uh, here's the genome of the bacterial cell. Uh, the phage makes a, uh, a separate um, genome that's replicating in the cell. And so it's, it's, uh, it's making all of its own replicated genomes. Um, and then those genomes get packaged with inside of uh, phage uh, capsids and then the phage uh, go off, they lyse the cell, and then they can go and infect a new cell. Well, what you can see here is that sometimes the phage messes up what DNA it packages into its capsid, and so what that happens, it can package some of the bacterial DNA, and so now this phage, when it goes and infects a new cell, um, it's not going to inject phage DNA, it's not going to actually hurt the cell, um, what it's going to do is deliver um, bacterial DNA that's probably from you know, that bacterial's cousins or, or related, uh, related bacterial strain. And so then this DNA can get incorporated into the genome and then become a part of its genome. So that's, how hor that's one of the, uh, a really uh, powerful mechanism for horizontal gene transfer. So there are two facts that every time I think about them, it really like hits home how common horizontal gene transfer actually is in the microbial world and how we really have to pay attention to, to how it works um, and to be able to predict, predict uh, its dynamics. So the first um, 
the first fact that always sort of astounds me is that you know a while ago we started sequencing whole genomes of different strains of bacteria now we do this routinely all the time our sequencing is really um, it, it's a lot easier nowadays and cheaper and so we do it all the time but the first three strains of bacteria that we sequence or e coli i should say that we sequence are strain b strain k12 and strain 0157H7. Uh, uh, you guys are probably too young to remember this, but this strain is a strain that was found in Jack in the Box food and actually caused some fatalities um, that, uh, that, um, uh, from people that, that had eaten uh, undercooked uh, um, burgers from Jack in the Box. They've cleaned their stuff up um, and you, know, you should not be afraid of it now. Um, but, you know, there are these cases where you get these pathogenic strains of E. coli. Most strains of E. coli are fine. They are um, not pathogenic. They live in our guts, uh, but some of them are pathogenic. And so, okay, back to horizontal gene transfer. What they found when they sequenced these genomes is that these three strains of the same species of bacteria only shared 40% of the same genes. So they, you know, most of the genes in their genome varied. And the way that you get this is certainly by deletions of genes and genomes over evolutionary time, but also by swapping uh, genes and horizontal gene transfer with maybe other species of bacteria um, or, uh, you know, distant strains of the E. coli. And so all of this horizontal gene transfer and gene deletion is really um, shaping and making uh, the genomes of these E. coli and really making them very distinct. You know, individual isolates of E. coli can vary a lot in their gene content. So just as sort of a point of reference, we share 98% of the same genes as chimpanzees are closest relative. They're only sharing 40%. Um, and actually, you know, if you sequence more, I'm sure you're, you, you find that the core genome the, the shared genes among all, all E. coli is, is even lower than that. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting. The other thing, so that, that tells you that, you know, there's a lot of horizontal gene transfer within a species, um, but there's this, this interesting fact um, when they were sequencing genomes of archaea bacteria and uh, U bacteria that live amongst archaea bacteria in hot springs. Um, and so these are really, these are really different groups of uh, organisms. There are separate domains of life. Uh, this is the, the tree of life down here. And uh, what we see in the tree of life is that these are all bacteria. And we'll go over the tree of life again when we go over phylogenies. Um, the, here's the archaea bacteria. Here's, here's us. Here's eukaryotes all the way down here. Um, and so what, what we see is that the U bacteria that live in these hot springs, their genomes are composed of 20% archaea bacterial genes. So one fifth of their genomes are genes from a completely different domain of life. And so that's, that's incredible. And presumably the reason why that number is so high is that they live close to each other, lots of potential for exchange, but also archaea bacteria have adapted to this extreme environment. And so these genes are really beneficial for the uh, U bacteria to take up. And so when they do, they get a benefit, and then you, you see them um, persisting in the population. So lots of genetic exchange happens in microbial populations and across huge uh, 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 evolutionary distances. The, the um, view of viruses uh, is even crazier. So viruses are always crazy. Uh, so, of course, it's even worse for them. But what I'm showing you here uh, is a figure where we have, we've sequenced three different genomes of viruses that are closely related to each other. And then um, all of these arrows are different genes. And um, if the gene is shared among the different genomes, then you see it connected by this uh, pink shading here. And so you can see that these are closely related viruses. They have you know, a lot of similar genes, but they have a lot of distinct genes as well. And so viruses are really often this mosaic of 
uh, recombinant genes sort of mash together. They, they tend to uh, uh, maintain the order in which the genes happen uh, in the genome, and they tend to have the same sort of core genes that they need to replicate, but then they just play around with all of these other kind of accessory genes. Um, and so viruses are undergoing recombination and horizontal gene transfer all of the time. Okay, so just to summarize um, this first section of the lecture, uh, recombination and horizontal gene transfer. So they are processes that are at two ends of the same spectrum, uh, genetic exchange between genomes. Um, they are common in microbes and a powerful tool to ge generate genetic variation. And it appears that SARS-CoV-2 may be a recombinant strain. So I see that there's some um, chats. So I'm gonna take a second just to look at them. If there are uh, questions, uh, I will answer them at the end of the lecture like last time. So the second part of the lecture is on genetic drift. And so we're making a transition now in understanding the evolutionary process. Uh, the first stage was, un was understanding how genetic variation arises. So that's through mutation and genetic recombination slash horizontal gene transfer. Um, and then once that genetic variation arises, now different processes act on that genetic variation to drive that variation to fixation. What that means is that that new mutation spreads through the population and then um, every individual in that population has that new mutation. And so it's easy to understand um, that in terms of if that's an adaptive mutation, so in terms of natural selection, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, but there's also this process called genetic drift that acts on mutations that uh, has, affects their frequency in the population and in some cases can even drive it to fixation. Okay, so this is just what I went over, that there's kind of a, that evolution is a two-step process we generate variation, and then we try to understand what processes act on influencing the frequency of that variation, either increasing the frequency uh, and driving it to fixation, or uh, decreasing its frequency and possibly dropping, uh, causing it to drop out of the population altogether. So far we've studied generation of genetic variation, and now we're gonna study in the next two lectures um, the processes that alter the frequency of that genetic variation. Okay, so this is our first question. Um, let's imagine a world where natural selection does not exist. What happens to mutations after they occur? So there's no natural selection. If a new mutation arises, what happens to it? Okay, so uh, actually all of these different um, things can happen to that mutation. So the mutation can be passed on from one generation to the next, or remain in the population indefinitely. This is kind of just theoretical. This is true when you have population sizes that are infinitely large. Um, so obviously there's no organism that has an infinitely large population size. And so I guess, I guess this really is not an option, but the math tells us if we did have that scenario, it could, it could uh, remain in the population forever. However, if we do have a finite population size, then um, uh, these other two outcomes can happen as well. We, if we have um, a finite population size, then we can have what's called genetic drift acting on this mutation. So they can be rapidly lost from the population. So if you have just one new mutation and you have thousands of individuals in a population, there's some random chance that that new mutation is just gonna get sort of pushed out of the population uh, because that individual just was unlucky and didn't survive and didn't have any, any offspring. The other, uh, the other option is that, and this is a very small probability and we'll go over that probability later, um, is that, that that allele, that new mutation, could actually randomly rise in frequency in the population until it fixes in the population, supplants the old allele, and now you have a population that has uh, undergone an evolutionary change. 
So what types, um, what types of mutations don't experience natural selection? Uh, and so these are called neutral mutations. They're neutral because they're neutral in res respect to their fitness benefit or fitness loss. They're neutral with respect to natural selection. So some examples of these mutations, there's lots of them. Probably the majority of mutations in the genome are actually neutral mutations. They don't affect the phenotype of an organism and therefore they, uh, natural selection can't see them and act on them. And so um, the first type that we're gonna talk a lot about are what we call synonymous mutations. And so this is just my uh, little cartoon of a protein. So this is a gene that in this region of, that, of the genome that encodes for a single protein. And so uh, if you uh, can go back to introbiology and think about the genetic code, uh, we know that three nucleotides um, get decoded into, so they're a codon and they get decoded um, into an amino acid. And then that amino acid is a part of a chain that forms into the protein. So that's the central dogma of molecular biology. And what we know is that there's redundancy in the genetic code so that certain codons, so UUU, this is RNA uh, for DNA BTTT, um, has the exact same um, codes for the exact same amino acid as UUC. So this is another example where all four of these codes here code for a serine. Uh, and so you can see that there's a lot of redundancy in the code. And so if, um, you know, if this mutates into a C, then it doesn't have any effect on the protein that's, that's made by the cell. And so it's unlikely to have any effect on the phenotype of the organism. So these are synonymous mutations. They behave neutrally. Um, often intergenic mutations. This is not always true. Um, but often if a mutation falls uh, between genes, and this region between genes doesn't influence uh, the gene expression, how, how much of the protein is made of this gene or how much of the protein is made of this gene, then you, um, those, those mutations don't really matter and um, they just drift neutrally in the, in the population. The other example uh, that we'll talk a lot about are pseudogenes. And so what pseudogenes are, so we have a genome that has a single um, protein here, a single gene for a protein. Um, and what can happen is by, you know, maybe the polymerase, when it's replicating the DNA, messes up and accidentally makes two copies of that, that portion of the DNA. And so then you have what's called a gene duplication. So we have a new gene here. Now the genome has two copies of the exact same gene, and it really doesn't need two copies of it. It was fine with just one before. And so mutations can accumulate in these genes and knock them out so that they, they no longer express a, a, a functional protein. And so when that happens, we call this a pseudogene, it's a dead gene. And so any mutation that happens in that dead gene um, is now a neutral mutation because that gene's not, not even turned on. And so it can just accumulate lots and lots more mutations. And so these are really helpful because these are kind of these um, they can just accumulate mutations without, uh, without experiencing any deleterious effects or beneficial effects. And so they can become our kind of um, these, these mutational timers that we can use um, to see how often mutations uh, occur just in the genome if you're not having, experiencing things like natural selection acting on the, the DNA sequence. And so these are gonna be key and you'll, you'll understand why uh, as we go through the other lectures. So pseudogenes, dead genes, can accumulate mutations without any deleterious effects. Okay, so let's go back to that question where we talked about you know, these very different fates of a neutral mutation. Why, you know, why can they have these very different uh, behaviors? And the reason is, so I, I wanna focus in on B and C in particular, uh, B is where the mutation is just lost from the population, whereas C is where the mutation um, fixes in the population. So those are the exact opposite um, uh, responses. And so why, why, how could 
you know, one mutation do these two very different things. Uh, and the reason is, is that what governs the changes in their frequency through time is this stochastic process, this neutral genetic drift. Uh, and really you can think of it like we thought of mutation as a coin flip process, as a random process. And so random processes can often result in very different outcomes. So here I'm going to go back to the camera and uh, just go over how genetic drift works on my whiteboard that's behind me. Okay, so let me reposition this. And so I want to see my app. This is just a coin flipping app on my phone. And so I said that genetic drift is a coin flipping process. And so I want to start a um, uh, fictional bacterial population with two red bacteria and two blue bacteria. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them each two opportunities to reproduce. And whether or not they reproduce is going to be based on um, if they get ahead when that coin is flipped. And so um, you'll see that um, you know, they, they all have the exact same potential to reproduce, but over a few generations, you'll see that maybe red will win out or maybe blue will win out. And so let's start with red. We have tails, so it doesn't reproduce. We have heads, so it does reproduce. So that yields one. We'll go to the next one. Okay, tails, it doesn't reproduce. Tails, it doesn't reproduce. So now we're gonna go down to, this one just doesn't, it dies off. And then we'll go down to the blue one. Tails, it doesn't reproduce. Tails, it doesn't reproduce. Okay, so now we're down to the last blue one. Heads, it does reproduce. Heads, it does reproduce. Okay, so now just after one generation, we went from 50% red alleles and 50% blue alleles. Now we have one third red alleles and two thirds blue alleles. So let's just repeat that process again. One more generation. Start with the heads. So we have a head, so it replicates. This is its second opportunity too. It's a tail, so it doesn't have a second offspring. Tails for its first opportunity to reproduce. Tails for a second op opportunity to reproduce. Tails for its first opportunity to reproduce. And heads. Okay, so now in the sec after the second generation, the second replication, um, what we have is actually we've restored the frequencies to 50-50. And so you could imagine that as you keep moving through this process, eventually one of these rounds, uh, blue may, never re may not reproduce at all randomly, whereas red does, and now the whole population is the red allele. And so just for stochastic reasons, uh, because as things, there's a carrying capacity to populations, and um, so the, and the, um, the, the populations are growing more, more than can be maintained in the, in the environment, so there's a carrying capacity, and if all individuals are exactly the same, then you know randomly individuals are going to be uh, removed from the population, and that is going to create this stochastic drift that we we went over. Okay, so let's go now to a simulation. There are really cool population genetic simulators on the internet that we can use um, to actually better simulate that process than. I'm doing with this coin flip and on the board. Okay.
So this is the simulator. It's incredible. I, I love this as a, as a tool. Um, but basically, what we're going to do in this, uh, with this window here is run an experiment, uh, a simulation, a computational experiment that's identical to this, just has many more cells and many more generations so you can see what happens. And so what, what it's showing here is that we're starting the, the, um, uh, the evolution with 50% blue and 50% red. Uh, the blue ones, uh, there's 10 of each of them. Uh, and we see that randomly, the red ones start to do better. Um, and then they, they end up fixing the population relatively uh, quickly. And so we can run a couple more simulations. Um, this, the red one wins again. That's just by random chance. Um, but it takes longer for it to win out. Red one wins again. It makes you feel like there's something directed happening, but it's not. Uh, this is random. Okay, here's one where they, they really just kind of uh, stay, you know, in, at near the same frequency over time. Here's finally one where the blue one wins out. And so the outcome of whether red or blue wins is just a, a coin flip. Um, and you can see that different dynamics happen um, on different iterations of, of the, the trials. So this is, this is a really nice way to sort of visualize how genetic drift act actually works. Um, but down here is a simulation. This is more like uh, what, what kind of data we would see, what kind of graphs we would plot of the, the allele dynamics through time. Uh, so we have generations on the x-axis and red allele frequency. Uh, here's the settings, we'll go over those in a second, but if we hit run, we can see that um, the allele uh, jostles around and then it goes on this trajectory where then it doesn't fix in the population, the red allele, it actually uh, goes extinct, it's removed from the population. And so the blue allele won in this trial. And so we can keep running so we're just hitting the simulation, it's recording the past ones. We can see all kinds of different behaviors. So it's pretty cool. Um, so this is initial red allele frequency. This just sets that it starts out here, uh, number of haploid individuals. That tells you how large the population size is, how many of those cells. You know, we started out with four um, haploid individuals there. Um, sorry, I'm pointing at my, um, at my uh, uh, board, but obviously you can't see that. Um, and uh, so the other thing is uh, the number of generations. That's just how long we run the evolution for. Um, and number of replicates, uh, you can actually, if you want to see sort of how repeatable certain behaviors are in the population, um, you can do lots of replicates. And you can see that you know, each of these uh, iterations, so there's 20 of them, are plotted here. And you can see that Sometimes the allele goes extinct, sometimes the allele fixes, sometimes it fixes early, sometimes it fixes later. On this iteration, 500 generations, it hadn't sorted out the evolution yet. Uh, we still have uh, genetic diversity in the population. And so um, just to sort of recap uh, what we're going on over, um, this is a plot of a neutral allele, a red allele, that's fluctuating through time randomly, moving up and down. Um, this, these are very typical uh, neutral dynamics. And I also want to go over just a little bit of jargon. Uh, so it turns out there's a lots of synonyms for what people call genetic drift. Um, and so I may accidentally switch between them. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, it's just a, a habit of once you're in the field and you get exposed to all of these different words, uh, you just tend to use them in interchangeably. Um, but that jargon is, um, random genetic drift. So that, that makes sense. It's genetic, it's random, and it's sort of drifting around rather than going in a particular direction. Stochastic drift just means random drift. Um, stochastic is a synonym for random. Um, neutral drift, that's just you're drifting because you don't have any uh, natural selection acting on you. Neutral evolution uh, or neutral theory is the math behind how this all works. So these tend to be used interchangeably. They mean subtly different things, um, but just you know, recognize all of these different words and that I'm, if I use them, that I'm talking about neutral processes, processes outside of natural selection.
Okay. So the mutational process was a random process. Genetic drift is a random process. We ultimately want to be able to predict evolution. And so how do we predict something if it's based on kind of two different random processes? Uh, and so it is very difficult to predict evolution for that reason, but there are some features to the random processes that uh, produce predictable behaviors. And so we talked about those for uh, mutations, in particular mutation rates, um, but uh, there's also predictable behaviors um, that random genetic drift also has. So the first very predictable thing is that the strength of drift on shaping uh, the allele frequency in a population is directly related to the population size of that population. And so if you have, these are simulations where I used, um, there are multiple uh, replicate simulations. Um, that's why there's multiple red lines. Each line associates with a, a single simulation. Um, and uh, this is for population size 10. And then this is for population size 100. And so, you, you know, visually you can see that there's differences. What, what are the differences? Well, you can see that the, the change from one generation to the next in this plot tends to be much more extreme, um, whereas the change is a lot less extreme here. And so the fate of the alleles, fixation or uh, extinction, uh, tends to happen rapidly in this small population, whereas it takes much longer and in many of the populations hasn't settled out after even 100 generations of evolution. And so um, why this is, is just think about that, that coin flip process, right? If you have a few coin flips, you know, if you have the number that I have had on the board, then, uh, you know, you could have where you get all heads one round or all, all tails one round. But if you were flipping that coin for 100 individuals rather than just a few, then it would be much harder to imagine getting all heads or all tails and so you just don't have the potential for these really wild shifts in the, in the allele frequency um, when you have lots and lots of individuals. Okay, so in the last lecture on mutations, I pointed out how pathogens have, or microbes tend to have huge population sizes. And so that gives them a lot of potential to mutate and a lot of potential to evolve. Um, so why are we even talking about genetic drift right now if it really doesn't play much of a role in shaping allele frequencies in really massively large populations? You know, this is the evolution of infectious diseases. Infectious diseases tend to be microbes. And um, so you know, why, why are we even worrying about this? Um, and the reason is that while microbes can have large population sizes, they fluctuate a lot in their population size, and that fluctuation has a really strong effect on shaping what we call the effective population size. And so I'll define the effective population size next and describe um, how these fluctuations really influence um, uh, drift processes. Okay. So I'm sorry, you know, we're all very nervous about getting sneezed on or at at the moment. So if this is triggering, I'm very sorry. Um, but just imagine that you have, you know, somebody has uh, SARS-CoV-2 and that, that uh, strain is growing in a patient and growing and growing and growing and infecting. And then, you know, a sneeze happens and that strain is spread to uh, another, another individual. And so during that process, you know, once it finally gets to that other individual, the, the population size, you know, it's, it's now what we call bottleneck, bottleneck down to very few individuals that actually make it um, to the next, uh, next patient and cause an infection. And yeah, now the population size is huge for it. Um, it has lots of mutations. But then what happens is it spreads to the next patient, goes through what we call a bottleneck, um, and has very few uh, individuals that spread to this patient. Um, and so this repeated up and down, the down has a huge effect on what we call the effective population size of the pathogen. And a lot of drift can happen here because you're going from lots and you're just picking out a handful of them. And anytime you're just sort of reaching for that handful, 
you could randomly grab you know, just one type of mutant and not multiple different types of mutants or not the, the, the main genotype uh, of the, the ones that were from this point. And so you can then, this patient has a brand new mutant um, that uh, he got that mutant not because of natural selection, but just by this sort of random picking process, this, this neutral uh, genetic drift. Okay, so this is just the text that goes over what I just said. So we'll keep moving. Okay, so now here's the map. How, if we have a fluctuating population size, um, how do we actually um, calculate what the effective population size is? And I'm going to teach you a new way of uh, averaging numbers, um, take, getting the mean. So this is the harmonic mean and not the arithmetic mean. Um, and we won't go into the exact theory for why we have to use this harmonic mean, but basically what the harmonic mean does is it accounts for the disproportionate effect of that bottleneck compared to the really large population size because drift happens more in small populations than in large populations. And so it accounts for that, that disproportionate effect. Uh, and we'll walk through some numbers so that'll be clear in a few minutes. So uh, we have to go over what this equation is, what these variables are. This is the effective population size. This is what we wanna determine. It's gonna be contingent on um, the population size at different time points. So this is time point i. So i equals one or time point two or time point three or time point four. So i goes up to t. Um, and so t is when we stop sampling you know, the population. And uh, so t is here as well. This is just the number of times we sample that population. We get data for it. Um, and then we compute the, the affected population. Okay, so let's actually just walk through, put in some, some numbers here. They're fake numbers, they're, they're smaller than we would imagine in a true uh, microbial population, uh, especially a viral population, but they're easy to work with. Okay, this just answers uh, why we have to use this uh, harmonic rather than the arithmetic mean. That's the normal mean, we've already gone over that. Okay, so say, you know, this is not uh, coronavirus, but flu particles, because this is a slide from last year, <laughs> and uh, it's fluctuating from 10 to 100, 10 to 100, 10 to the 100. Um, so how do we use this equation, given that we sampled the population density uh, of this virus um, six times, and we've gotten these um, six different values? So, we're, we want to solve for this, and um, one over t, so we have six different time points in which we sampled, so that's a six, and then here is one over the population size at those two different time points. So it goes 10 to 100, 10 to 100, 10 to 100. So then, I mean, it, it is really just calculating now. Um, and so what we get is one six times 0 0.33, one over NE will equal 0 0.055, and then NE equals 8.8. .8. So the effective population size, if you, were, um, if you were to take the arithmetic mean, you would get a, an average population size of 55. Um, but by doing this harmonic mean, we get an effective population size of 18.18 .18 particles. Um, and so this is much closer to the 10 and the 100, this is because, um, or the reason why we use this is because it reflects that this has a much more uh, dominant effect over uh, neutral genetic drift than uh, the large population does. So those bottlenecks have a big impact on um, whether or not uh, uh, an allele will drift. Okay, so I wanna move on to um, some other uh, uh, predictable behaviors of neutral genetic drift. Okay, so the probability of fixation, so that's reaching 100% of an allele, is exactly equal to its frequency. So I ran those simulations where I ran 10 simulations and I 
uh, started out with 10% of the population having the red allele. Um, and I ran, like I said, 10 different replicate simulations. And what you find in this instance is that nine of the 10 just went extinct and one of the 10 actually reached fixation. And so, you know, if this is a random process, the probability for it to um, actually, you know, rise all the way up to fixation is going to be related to just how frequent it is. And so if it's rare, most of the time it's just going to go extinct. If it's common, most of the time it's going to go uh, to fixation, but there is those, those rare instances where it will actually, actually fix. And so this is just showing you that if I start with 90% red allele, we have nine in 10 replicate populations that actually fix. One of them goes extinct though. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not true that all of them, even though they're, they're given this sort of head start, they're really close to the finish line of fixation, um, some of them have, are unlucky and will drift out of the population. So if this is a question now, if the probability of fixation reaching 100% of an allele is equal to its frequency, then what's the probability of going extinct, reaching 0%? The probability is just going to be one minus the frequency. So say, you know, say, say for instance, we started out at 10%, um, you know, nine of them went extinct and one of them went to fixation. And so one minus the frequency of 10% is 0.1. One minus 0.1 will give you 0.9. So 90% chance um, that the opposite behavior will happen. Um, and so it's really just that, that kind of inverse relationship between the probability of fixation versus the probability of going to zero. I wanna point out that the um, slides that I just went over, when I ran those simulations, they behaved you know, perfectly given the theory that the probability of fixation is dependent on the frequency of uh, the allele. And that is true. But that's a probability. That's not, you know, that's, a, that's a, what is likely to happen, not necessarily what will happen. And so uh, if you run those same simulations, these are, this is another example of running 10, starting out with 90%. We see that all 10 of them, 10 of 10, not nine of 10, uh, reach fixation. So remember, this, these are probabilities. They're, they'll tell you what is likely to happen, but not necessarily what does happen. So what is the rate of neutral evolution? You know, is it, is it slow? Is it fast? What circumstances is, is it possibly faster? Um, you know, how many neutral mutations do you expect to fix in a given number of generations? And so we have really great math uh, understanding neutral theory. Um, and so we can actually make this kind of prediction of you know, how, much, how much evolutionary change do we expect just given neutral processes, not even natural selection. So I wanna say that the thing that we're going to talk about calculating is called the neutral substitution rate. So given something like a pseudogene where uh, all of the mutations are neutral, um, what's the rate at which you'll see uh, new mutations arise in that gene but not just a rise in that gene, um, fix in the population, that's when a, when a mutation fixes, it substitutes the old nucleotide at that location, and so that's called a substitution. So what's the rate that this neutral gene uh, gets new mutations that substitute in, into the, 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 um, the population, into the, into the, the gene? So, why I'm about to sort of focus on this calculation is because this actually um, is the basis of molecular clocks and is a major tool that we use um, in order to track the, uh, the timing and the spread of uh, pathogens. And so certainly we're using molecular clocks right now to retrace when SARS-CoV-2 emerged into the human population. 
Okay, so here is just sort of the, the math underlying it. So what I really love about this is that um, this calculation builds on two things that we've already learned about, um, and it simplifies into a very simple um, uh, mathematical equation. And so it's really elegant, and normally, you know, biology gets really complicated and things become really complicated really fast in biology. But here's a case where um, we have a very simple uh, calculation um, and, it, and it makes our life a lot easier. So getting there is complicated, but once we get there, life will be easier. Okay. So we have, um, we have to, we're going to put two things together. The first is this mathematical expression for the rate of new mutations. So this is, this is you know, we have a gene and we're, there's some rate at which, which that gene just randomly mutates. Um, and so the rate at which that gene is gonna be randomly mutating in a, in a population is going to be uh, the number of individuals in that population times the, the mutation rate. So every time that, you know, when you, like on the board, you have one generation and the next generation, there's some potential for each of those individuals when they replicate um, to uh, mutate. And so that's the rate at which we're going to get brand new mutations influxing into this gene. Then for us to be able to predict um, the rate of substitutions, we're not just predicting the rate of new mutations coming into that gene. We're also predicting, we also have to, it, that substitution rate also depends on those new mutations fixing in the population and you know, causing that final evolutionary change so that that allele of that gene is now different in that population. And so um, the, the probability that a new mutation fixes in the population is one divided by the population size. So by definition, a new mutation exists as one in the population. And um, so its frequency is going to be one divided by its population size. And we know from before that the frequency of a mutation is its probability of reaching fixation. So that's one over n. So the first thing tells us how, how fast are new mutations coming into this population. Uh, and then the, the second one is, um, what's the probability that any of those new mutations will fix? And those things combined together give you the neutral substitution rate. So um, I guess before I get back to math, um, I just wanted to show you simulations that I ran um, that were based on just a single new mutation uh, coming into a population uh, at, at time point one. And then 20 generations later, um, what do we expect will happen to that new mutation? And so that new mutation um, goes extinct here, goes extinct, goes extinct, goes extinct. Blah, 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 I kept running this over and over again. And then finally I got one simulation where it actually um, went to fixation. And then we have these other simulations here. I kept going for 20 trials uh, and we found that it, it only went to fixation once. So this is in line with the theory that the probability of fixation is its frequency and its frequency for this population is one over N, one in 20. So for all of these simulations, all of these populations. So now getting back to the, the math, um, I said that the neutral substitution rate is going to be equal to the influx of new mutations by the probability that any one of those new mutations actually fixes in the population. And so what's really cool is that N is in the numerator and N is in the denominator. And so what that means is that the neutral substitution rate is directly equal to the mutation rate. So they're, they're different things, but they are directly equal to each other. So the neutral substitution rate depends on N in two different ways that cancel each other out. And so what this means is that if we have a neutral piece of DNA accumulating mutations, um, you know, and we want to understand how, how fast are those mutations, or is that, is that piece of DNA going to change over time? We don't have to have knowledge of what the 
old population sizes were of that pathogen. Did they start out small? Did they get larger? How did they fluctuate through time? We don't need that information. All we need is the genetic sequence of the current uh, virus and the genetic sequence of an old virus. And um, if we have a mutation rate, then we can sort of track back um, how long ago that old virus um, arose. Okay, so I'm getting, kind of getting ahead of myself. That's on molecular clocks, and we'll get into that specifically in the future. Um, but it's really cool that the neutral substitution rate is just dependent on the mutation rate. Okay, so that's a lot of, you know, just kind of algebra and math. Let's actually go through um, how this works in two different populations. Um, and this exercise is going to unite the things that we learned in the mutation section and the things that we're learning about neutral genetic drift um, into, into sort of one exercise. And so uh, population A, we're going to look at um, how a pseudogene evolves in population A and in population B. Um, that pseudogene has a, is a thousand base bases. Um, the per base, uh, per generation genome uh, mutation rate is 10 to the minus six. So this is a normal, this is normal for like a DNA virus. Um, and we're gonna allow the, this population to evolve for a thousand generations. And so we have two different, we're gonna do two different calculations. One for a population that is um, small with just 10 individuals, and then one for a population that is 100 individuals. The goal of walking through all of this with you is to help you get a sense of why um, the, the neutral substitution rate is directly dependent on the mutation rate and that population size doesn't matter. Okay, so here are graphs for population one and population two. We have number of individuals on the y-axis. You can see that they're different. Um, the x-axis are the same. We have 10, so we're running for 1,000 generations, so 10 times 100 generations is 1,000. So that's 1,000, this is zero. Um, and so the first thing that we have to calculate is, oh, sorry, I have to move a, move a window out of the way. Um, the first thing that we have to calculate is how many mutations will occur in this popula population over a, a thousand generations. So remember, the first thing about that equation is just an influx of random mutations into the population. So given, given the parameters that we went over in the last slide, how many mutations do we expect to see here over a thousand generations? So to answer this, what I'm first gonna answer is how many mutations do we expect after one generation in the pseudogene, given that there's 10 individuals? So just one niche on the, on the, on the x-axis. So it's gonna be the number of mutations will equal the population size. So each individual is gonna replicate once, that's one generation. Um, and so that's the population size times the per base mutation rate, so that's the rate of errors accumulating, times the number of bases that we're, that we're observing and we're focusing on just that, that pseudogene. And so that is a population size of 10, this very low 10 to the minus six error rate, um, times there's a thousand nucleotides that each time it replicates, it, it can produce a, an error among those thousands. And, uh, and so what we get is that in the first generation we expect 0.01 mutations. Okay, so what do we expect now over a thousand generations? So that's just a thousand times 0.01, and that's 10. So what does that look like? Okay, so we're, what we're doing here is we're observing a population evolving through time. It has 10 individuals in it, uh, and we expect by random chance, it'll have 10 mutations. Uh, you can see that I kind of jostled the mutations around, they, on average, evolve, you know, occur in every uh, 100 generations, but you know, sometimes they occur early, sometimes they occur later. It's a random process, remember that. So let's do the same calculation for um, the next population. 
And so what we see is that, you know, given a larger n, 100, now we have a, a 0.1 rather than a 0 0.01. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if we run this um, for a thousand times, I'm sorry, uh, there is, oh yeah, okay. So yeah, 0.1 and we run it for a thousand times. Um, this is wrong. I'm sorry. This is a carryover from the from the other um, the other equation that I copied and pasted up here. This should be 0.1. So 0.1 times a thousand will give you a hundred mutations. This is not 0 0.01. It's just 0.1. This is a mistake in the slide. I'll correct it on the on the course uh, website. So we have a hundred uh, mutations that we expect in this scenario. And so that looks like that. And so now it looks like, well, the top population has many fewer mutations and so should have less potential um, for evolution and less potential for substitutions. And so it should have a lower um, rate of neutral substitution than the bottom one. But this is where we factor in the probability that any one of these mutations will actually fix in that population. So, how many of these mutations in the first population will fix? The answer is one divided by n, and that is one in 10. And individuals here, this is occurring in one individual. And so that one in 10, now, um, so among all of these 10 mutations, only one is expected to, to fix in the population. So that's the, the lucky one there. And so over this thousand generations, actually only one of these mutations actually substitutes the, the allele um, that was originally in the population, changes that allele, and now all the individuals after this point in time have uh, that pseudogene with this, with this now this new mutation. And so all of them look like a, a brand new allele, a brand new um, uh, gene. So the rest of these, what happened to them is they just probably popped into the generate, popped into the population and popped back out. Just like when we looked at those 20 simulations, the majority of them, 19 out of 20, uh, the mutations arose and then fell back out of the population quickly. And now um, that's what would happen in this population as well. One in 10, not one in 20. Okay, so let's do the same thing for the bottom population. And so it's the exact same calculation. And so we expect only one of these 100 mutations is likely to fix. And so the substitution rate or the number of substitutions over a thousand generations in each of these populations is identical, even though they have two different population sizes. The N influences the influx of mutations and it decreases the probability of any one of those mutations goes to fixation. And so the N cancels Okay, so that is just sort of a, a really a glimpse at neutral evolution. There's a lot of theory behind neutral evolution, um, but that's enough of the math so that you'll understand um, some of the uh, techniques that we'll use later to study the evolution of, of pathogens. Okay, so thank you guys.